The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101 with host Susan Bartlestone. We're so happy you've joined us. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's the host of Crime Prevention 101, Susan Bartlestone. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining me. And I have to tell you, I am really looking forward to tonight's show because I've wanted to do this show for quite a while. We're going to be talking about sexting. And the only thing that's new about sexting is the word. And the way it's being done, because people have been sending naked pictures of themselves to others for decades. And usually when we use the word sexting, we're talking about teens and young adults. And we're going to bring that up to tonight. But when my New York congressman, Anthony Weiner's political career petered out because he tweeted pictures of his Weiner to a young woman, and we know that one Weiner joke is mandatory, then, and then New Jersey Congressman Louis Magazu, if I'm saying that right, just got caught sexing and he had to resign. Well, I just have to know the reason why. Why do prominent and powerful men, and so far it's only been men who've been caught, why do they do this? And I've got psychiatrist Charles Sophie with me tonight, and he's been all over the media talking about this, and hopefully he can help us all understand it. And he's also got some tips for parents uh, who are worried about their kids sexting. And if you are a parent, you should be worried. Sexting is pervasive and it's spreading. Then Crime Prevention 101's old friend Tom, Todd Morris from Brick, Brick House Security is stopping by with some great personal safety products for you. And he's got stuff that will help you monitor your children's cell phones and computers for sexting and for other dangerous activities. And to start us off, I'm continuing with my summer reading series with the multi-award-winning crime novelist David Corbett. And one reviewer said about him, the line runs through Ernest Hemingway and Graham Greene straight on to David Corbett. I'm not kidding, he's that good. Sounds terrific, right? I can't wait. All right, well, this is the puzzled and perplexed Susan Bartlestone coming to you live from New York City, the big malum, as they say in Latin, and tonight, while the Malum bakes, we're heating it up some more here on Crime Prevention 101. And I also want to take a second tonight to welcome my new sponsor, MyForce. Couldn't be happier to have them on board. I just love this product. I'm going to introduce you to them properly in September when I have them on the show with me. Meantime, please check them out at www.myforce, that's F-O-R-C-E, myforce.com. All right, my first guest, David Corbett, he's written four crime novels. One was named the New York Times Book of the Year. One was nominated for an Edgar. His most recent, Do They Know I'm Running, won the Spine Tingler Best Novel Award. And he's also the editor of a local website dedicated to linking up all the neighborhood watch groups in Vallejo, California, which he says is the first major city in California to file for bankruptcy. Yuck. But in this time of cuts, you know, to police forces and so forth, neighborhood watch programs are going to take on added importance. And so I'm hoping we have time to talk with him about it. Meanwhile, David, hello and welcome. Hello, Susan. Pleasure to have you with me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, let's just jump right in here. Let's start with, uh, let's first start with the, the latest book, which Do You Know I'm Running? And this has kind of, kind of got an, un, uh, an unusual uh, topic. T- talk a little bit about this book and how you came to write it in this, uh, on this topic. Well, this is my fourth novel. My third novel, um, Blood of Paradise, is about El Salvador. And I had been introduced to El Salvador by a woman I had met and I had dated for a couple of years. And I traveled down there and knew the country well. And what bothered me and what prompted that book was everybody talked about organized crime in Central America, and they were always talking about gangs and, and this 
Basically, and what was the name? What was the name of that book? That book was Blood of Paradise. That's my third. Okay, and that's the one that won the Edgar, right? Well, no, I, that was nominated for the Edgar. It was nominated, yet. okay. Right, and um, and I wanted to point out that organized crime in in Central America wasn't just street gangs; that there were mafias composed of business people and and soldiers that were very deeply entrenched in society. And that was that was sort of my goal in writing that book. When I was finishing it up, it was 2006, 2007, and that was when the immigration debate was once again heating up. And I was, as, as I was watching sh- programs about this and hearing some pretty heated vitriol about uh, immigrants and our, and our communities, I was watching the scroll at the bottom of the screen and looking at how many Latino names uh, were listed among the casualties in the Iraq War. And if you remember, 2006, 2007, we were in particular having very heavy casualties. And mm-hmm. As I read up a little bit on it, I found out that actually Latino recruits were suffering higher casualties in combat than any other identifiable subgroup. And it just sort of spurred an idea. I thought, what would happen if you were uh, an Iraqi vet coming back from the war, uh, badly wounded, you'd, you'd paid not the ultimate price, but very close to, mm-hmm. to, to do what you felt was important for this country, only to find out that a very close family member on whom the family relied had been caught in an immigration raid and deported. What would that do to you? What would that do to the family? How would they respond? Would they respond well? Would they make mistakes? Would they decide, well, you know, screw the law, we're going to do whatever we want? And unfortunately, that is the decision they make, and they, they leave it to the youngest in the family, the 18-year-old Roque, to go down and help their uncle get back, because it's a very treacherous path these days. Uh, immigration now, but with, with the fact that organized crime has taken over almost all the smuggling routes, just being an immigrant coming from Central America is far more dangerous than it ever has been. And that was pretty oh, much right. my impetus. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought they were sort of independents that were, you know, just nasty people. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, the individual coyote has, has been out of business for at least four or five years. Ah. It's, um, uh, the, 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 either the, the street gangs or the street gangs at the, uh, at the behest of the larger drug cartels, for example, the Zetas or the Sinaloa cartel, or um, the, the Zetas in particular were very much into immigrant smuggling, and uh, so was uh, the Michoacana Familia. And uh, those two groups in particular have very much invested themselves in using the immigrants not just as a form of cash, but as decoys in their drug running. And they're involved in, in the human trafficking also. Is oh, very much. Right? Yeah. yeah. So you managed to craft a novel out of this very... You know, fact, and this is this is you know obviously true thing that's happening. And well, I wanted, I, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the point of view of a young Latino American who is a citizen. He was born here, and you know most kids have an incomplete understanding of what it means to be an American, what it means to be, uh, and what it means to have a heritage. I mean, they're kids; they don't really know. And this book is all about him learning what it means to be an American, what it means to be an immigrant, what it means to be. You know that the youngest son in a family of men. Um, it, it. I hate to call it a, call, a coming of age, but it is certainly a wising up novel, and it is a novel in which uh, this 18-year-old becomes wise beyond his years. Oh, indeed. Well, I'm not, I don't want you to tell us the ending, but you managed to make a very suspenseful book out of this. I'm. I, I'm very happy with it. I think it's my best book. All right, let's talk about some of the the earlier things you did. Uh, Done for a dime and the Devil's Redhead, which I just love that I love that title. Give well, us a um, little, the Devil's Redhead was based. Um, I was a private investigator for 15 years, and when I first started, uh, we had a number of cases involving marijuana smugglers from the 70s, and that was a different era. Uh, these were largely, um, especially the groups that we defended, were uh, based on a group of guys out of. Coronado, California, and they're Navy brats. They'd been around boats their entire lives and had become, you know, little by little, you know, going from just getting, you know, drugs for a party to going across to getting marijuana in bigger and bigger doses until they, um, until the loads required somebody to speak Spanish and they enlisted their Spanish teacher to, uh, in high school oh. to uh, be their kingpin. And uh, he right, ultimately. They're not, they're they're not paying the teachers enough, right? That yeah, makes it, was, sense. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating story. That guy's name was Lou Villar. But, um, mm-hmm. These, and they teamed up with guys coming back from Vietnam who just were restless at home. They, they wanted a life of adventure, and marijuana smuggling provided it. But they really weren't dangerous. They were more wild than they were criminal. But mm-hmm. with the uh, beginning of the 80s and the Reagan administration's deciding to focus on marijuana, um, these guys were 
cut out of the business very early. And I remember it was about 1988. I was talking to my boss, and I said, you know, we're just not getting the kind of clients we used to. And he said, oh, if those guys were still in the business, they'd be betrayed or killed. And that was the germ of the story for Devil's Redhead. It's about a former marijuana smuggler who takes a 10-year fall so the rest of his crew can get three, including his girlfriend. And when he gets out, uh, has one ambition, and that is to get back together with his girlfriend, even though it's a violation of his parole. And it's the standard story of where he finds out she's in trouble, he tries to get her out, instead he, he gets sucked in. So, uh, Is he the redhead, or is she the oh, redhead? No, no, she is. <laughs> she's, a, she's a Texas redhead from Odessa, Texas, named Lachelle ah. Bergery, So Interesting. And he took, he took a 10-year rap for these guys, huh? Well, I didn't. Well, yeah. I mean, he took the fall because he was the leader, and he just felt that was his job. And, and it was back in the day when, there were, when you actually could make plea arrangements like that. You know, the, the government's case wasn't that great. Uh, if they could get the leader, they would feel satisfied, um, as long as everybody else at least got some time. And, he, and so the trade-off was, you know, that the leader gets ten, everybody else gets three, and he does a hard ten. He does all ten years. Okay, I'm I'm putting that down on my summer reading list. Now, how about Done for a Dime? Give me Done a little for bit a Dime of a was uh, sort of based on my hometown of Vallejo before it filed for bankruptcy. But um, it, says it was a city in transition. It had been a Navy town. Uh, we had the largest shipyard on the West Coast, at, except for San Pedro and had been very instrumental in taking, refurbishing the nuclear submarines as part of the Pacific Fleet. Uh, in 1994, that shipyard was closed, and the city went through a huge convulsion. Basically, you know, it had been, that had been the city's main employer for almost a century. And what was the city going to do? And this is a classic setup for crime, arson, and, uh, and, when you have so many people leaving, real estate values plunge, but that's an opportunity for developers and other uh, people with an eye for making you know, a quick profit. And, um, and so these profiteers basically machinate city council to give them the last hillside property facing the bay in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, and that was pretty much the setup for that one. Ah. California, California noir is almost always about real estate. It's a, it's a fundamental, uh, it, it, the, the crime almost always gets down to land out here. I don't know why. Uh, it's something that we have always well, done historically. Since, since we're talking about Vallejo, you, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit because I, I want to spend at least a little bit of time in this. You have another, I don't know if it's a job, but you have another uh, thing that you do where you work as an editor for Neighborhood Watch. and, and well, it's, Vallejo it's, a, it's, is it's a volunteer thing. It's something that a bunch of us got together. When, when Vallejo went through bankruptcy, it was obliged to completely, well, the tension was we were, we were so underwater because of pension, benefit, and wage contracts with our public service unions. Mm-hmm. And there was really no solution to it. The, the leaders of the unions were pretty intrans- intransigent, particularly the firefighters. And the city had uh, been mismanaged for a very long time. There was very bad blood and suspicion on both sides. And ultimately, it got to the point where the city just couldn't pay its bills. And so we had to file for Chapter 9, which is very rarely done. And I think mm-hmm. our example is going to cure anybody else of wanting to do it, because it's very expensive, and we didn't solve all of our problems. But one of the things that did happen was our police department went from 150 officers down to 90. Ooh. And, that was a, and this is a relatively, it's not really a high-crime town, but we do have certain problems, because it's, it's how, not a wealthy How big town. is Vallejo? I'm just curious. I'm, I'm sorry, Susan, what was that? How big is Vallejo? How big is town? It's about 120,000. Ah, Okay. And it's at the and top you're now of, uh, down the San Francisco to, you're now Bay. down to 90 police officers. I'm sorry? You're now down to 90 police officers. That's right. And um, once, uh, once the economy went in the tank, we began to have a lot more opportunistic burglaries. Uh, the violence ticked up. That, that seemed to be pretty much sort of gang-related. Um, but there were, uh, there were robberies um, and, uh, as I said, a number of burglaries. And crime did tick upward. We also had a lot of... Um, abandoned houses or foreclosed houses, and these are nests for trouble. I mean, you have a lot of squatters, and uh, this has a tendency to really degrade a neighborhood. So a, lot of, a, a handful of us decided to get together, and the neighborhood, groups, neighborhood watch groups were ballooning. We'd gone from something like 12 to over 250 when we got this idea. But we realized that you know, having your own group is great, but, it's, but you need to be informed about what's going on around you to adequately prepare everybody for what might be happening in your neighborhood, because burglary crews and so on and so forth, you know, they they don't stick in your neighborhood. So we got that uh, idea, and we also wanted to create a sort of a political platform from the neighborhood level of saying, you know, this is what the neighborhoods 
tell us they need. And this is what you need to hear. And um, to become sort of a voice for neighborhood concerns, specifically with crime, but basically quality of life issues all the way around. Uh, we had a, a major prostitution problem. We've been very instrumental in trying to get the city to focus on that. We now have surveillance cameras in some very key areas uh, where that are usually uh, used by prostitutes in their johns. Um, drug dealing has been another problem. We've been able to mitigate some of that. But it's, it's something where the citizens realize that this is not an anomaly. This is what the future is going to look like, which means we have to become engaged in our city. And that has been a very positive thing. Well, this is, this is actually one of the reasons that I wanted to, to bring this up. Um, because Vallejo isn't the only city that's facing this. New York City is facing this. And, oh, and San New York Diego's State facing is... it. Los Angeles is facing it. Sure. There's so, a, no, what... it's, it's a, and I mean, I think what we're finding, especially with the economy, not just in the, in the trough it's in, but with the prospects of getting out seemingly critically unclear, that we may be looking at the nature of the future here. And it may be that we, if, if, if government is going to have to cut back and cut back and cut back, then citizens can't expect the same things. They're going to have to, instead of, you know, if they're not paying tax dollars for these things, they're going to have to pay in time and personal investment to make their cities livable. And I, I think that's just something that everybody's going to have to wake up to. Yeah, neighborhood watches are one of the things that people really need to consider. But your idea of, of linking them together is, is a critical piece. And just the... I'm going to get, take a couple of more minutes um, and uh, give me an idea of the kind of things uh, that you do with this website. Well, first of all, what we realized is that we sort of had to, it, to create a certain sense of territoriality, that we didn't want to just go citywide, and that we divided the city into four quadrants and tried to enlist people who would be willing to take responsibility for that quadrant, two or three people who were like quadrant leaders, who would make sure that the word got out into their specific areas and who would reach out to the various um, block watch captains and ask them, what's going on in your area? If you have a crime alert, let us know. We'll make sure it gets on the website and we'll spread that word out. And it was just a way to, to sort of create a format and a structure so that people you know, were considerably, con consistently informed. And, and we could also narrow it down so it wasn't like we were having to control all 350. It is up to 350 now, block watches, that each person wow, would have only yeah. about 100, which is still a lot. But to spread the word, make sure that they had a, an email tree that would lead to all of these block watch captains, and then they could inform everybody in their neighborhoods whenever we felt that a critical crime issue or a public safety issue or um, quality of life issue was affecting one part of town or another. And what we've had in particular, like I said, we've had uh, opportunistic bur uh, burglaries, we've had car thefts, we've had break-ins. This has been the, the major thing. And, but we've also wanted to, to disseminate information about how do you solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And that has been critical. You know, how to use code enforcement. You know, who to call at the, at the, at the uh, city. And to develop a relationship with the city so that they realize that you are a block watch captain. That automatically gives you a credibility. And we're finding that once the police realize the block watch captains are calling them with a problem, their response times usually get cut down, and there's a, there's a, a, ch a chain of trust that, that gets built, which I think is crucial. It, there's no longer this weird anonymous relationship between the police and the citizenry. We're actually building communication links that I think are critical. And, in fact, tonight I'm also going to, it's called Citizens on Patrol. It's a volunteer organization that works directly with the police to do some of the bureaucratic and office-related tasks so more police can actually be on the street. And I'm taking place in, in that as well. It's a 10-week program. I would think that the police are, are extremely pleased that, uh, you know, you're, you're helping them. I'm, I'm, I'm betting that they're happy to do anything they can. Well, they, to, they are. Uh, and, and, um, and, and they've gotten religion on the thing as well. They realize that their resources are tapped out. And uh, the firefighters as well. I did an emergency response training program with them. And... Uh, they're thrilled to know that they have citizens that are engaged with them in a positive way because the bankruptcy created some serious tensions with the city and with the citizenry. There was some bad blood because some of the firefighters and cops felt that the city wasn't standing behind them. 
Um, you know, they, we didn't want to pay them the wages. And it wasn't a case of where we didn't want to. It, we can't. We don't have mm-hmm. the revenue stream to be able to do it. We're a poor yeah, exactly. city. I mean, our, the median income here is about 55000 which may sound like a lot, but firefighters and cops, I mean, the city invests about $200,000 per firefighter and cop in terms of wage, benefit packages, pension uh, contributions, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's a, there's a serious imbalance wage-wise and, and benefit-wise on that. And uh, I think that everybody's gotten religion, and we all realize that we all need to work together to make this a safe city, a prosperous city, and uh, we'll just see, you know, how long it takes us and, and what's entailed. All right, David, this is great. And I would love for people who are in the same boat. And, the, and honestly, um, uh, my listeners are very crime prevention oriented. This is something that, that, that's going to have to be done more and more places. Can they take a look at this website or someplace well, like that? Yeah, the website is called Vallejo, and that's V as in Victor, A L L E J O, Vallejo Lamplighter dot org. And Lamplighter is just as it's. You know, it sounds L A M P L I G H T E R dot org. Vallejo you know Lamplighter dot org. Send me, send me, email me that because I'm going to put it in the show notes. Okay. And, um, I'm happy to. David, I thank you so much for coming on tonight. I'm putting all your books on my reading list. Well, thank I you. I want everyone to go to www.davidcorbett, C O R B E T T dot com. Check out these books. And he's he's got. Great reviews for his writing. I can't wait. Thanks so much, David. Well, thank you, Susan. All right. You have a lovely Now, just recently, two politicians, one of them a strong candidate for the next mayor of New York City, had their career tank because they just had to send naked pictures of themselves to women who didn't want them. We all want to know why did they risk it all to bear it all. Let's take a quick pause, and hopefully we'll find out when we come back. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in your brain inspired really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. Protect yourself and your family with MyForce, a personal security service accessed through a smartphone app that acts as your dedicated safety escort. The one-touch alert connects to a live monitoring team that provides the authorities with crucial details to expedite help. MyForce provides emergency response with a user's exact location, physical description, known safety issues, and medical conditions. MyForce offers monthly subscriptions at $11.99 per month or save with the annual plan of $119 a year. As a listener of Crime Prevention 101, Receive $20 off an annual subscription by using promo code CP101. Visit MyForce.com today. Violence, theft, drugs, graffiti, it's all part of joining a gang. In times like these, we need to protect our kids and our community from gangs. Gangs often prey on teens with low self-esteem who perform poorly in school and who seek a sense of belonging. Protect kids from gangs. Know who they're hanging out with. Encourage them to become involved in school activities. Give kids a positive alternative to gangs. To learn more, visit ncpc.org or contact your local law enforcement agency. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, National Crime Prevention Council, and the Ad Council. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello again, Susan Bartlestone here, and this is Crime Prevention 101, and we've got an optimistic perspective on a sober subject, so please get the word out. Start tweeting about us. Let people know we're here. And you know what? You can follow me on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Come and join the movement. All right, now we're going to be talking about sexing. And uh, just a quick uh, resource for you. I found a company called Spectrosoft, S-P-E-C-T-O-R-S-O-F-T, and it has all sorts of sexting technologies for businesses as well as for parents. You might want to take a look at their website, 
Vectorsoft.com. I'm going to post the link in my CrimePrevention101.com blog. And now let us meet our sexting expert, Dr. Charles Sophie, and he is uh, certified in adult psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, family practice psychiatry. So he, he's got to know about this. He's medical director at the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, and they oversee over 40,000 foster children's care. And he's the author of Side by Side, the Revolutionary Mother-Daughter Program for Conflict-Free Communication. And when he's not appearing on the Today Show, Rachel Ray, he's traveling all over the country, and he's now on Crime Prevention 101. Welcome, Dr. Sophie. Thank you. How are you? Well, if anyone can help us understand why Congressman Anthony Weiner had to do what he did, I think you can. So let's just start at the, at the beginning. For those who are not absolutely sure, what exactly is sexting? Sexting is sending via text on your phone any sexually explicit material, whether it's text that's written or it's pictures and or a combination of those. And it's sending them through, again, via text on your phone. And also Twitter, because that's, exactly, that's yes. social media yes. sites, because that, that's right. where our, my congressman got tripped up. Exactly. Um, and uh, I just want you know, when I put out a call for some, some background and information on this, I got a couple of emails, and I could just sort of encapsulate them to you because maybe you can help me understand it. This this one man emails me and, and I, I took him to an older man and he's a, he gave me his name, he's the author of several books and he said sexting is simply romance and mental manipulation by the Rico Suaves of the world. If you're a decent social engineer you use sexting to get into women's or men's pants because it's easier to do than social interaction. I've had women within two days, usually by an exchange of sultry photos. And then another guy emails me that he considers himself a professional sexter, and uh, he's someone who really does it right. And then I also happened to catch a TV show, um, which was talking about a TV show that's on now, and that show is called Ice Loves Coco. I don't know if you know about this show, but... Coco does something that she calls Thong Thursday. And every Thursday she tweets a picture of herself in a thong. Now, is that considered sexting? And what do you think about what these men were saying? Well, I think, you know, in general, the mechanism of texting allows a level of connection with somebody that doesn't require you to really fully step up. So physically you don't have to be there. You could send someone else's picture, really, but it doesn't require you to really be there in every, you know, human and emotional capacity. So it allows you to escape a lot of the things that you would have to if you were face-to-face. So there's that piece, and then there's all of the places that someone can go when they're sexting or receiving a sext and be able to fantasize but never have to deal with a reality because, again, there's not another person standing there that you have to answer to or you're responding with. So it's a lot of that kind of playing and fantasy and all of that kind of stuff that allows people then to get pulled into it. It's really when the realities come into play that you see if people really step up and meet or they follow through with all of the things that that have been said in that sexting to see if they're really going to connect with you and, and do it. But it's really a mechanism for you to be somebody you don't really, you know, are, you're not really are in your own everyday life maybe, or a way for you to fantasize yourself to someone else. And then someone like else who may the be Rico that. Suave thing, right? This guy's going, he thinks it's romantic. Yeah, and absolutely. I guess, right. And, I guess and he may not consensual. be able to be that romantic in reality, but he can play it in fantasy. And then if you're a woman or someone on the receiving end of a sex thing, and you're in a bad spot or you're upset with your husband or not really happy, then it's going to be easy to get somebody who's giving you compliments and telling you nice things about yourself and telling them great things about themselves. And it's all fantasy-based until it really comes down to seeing if there's a reality to it. Now, what about something like Coco? Coco is the wife of a rapper and actor, Ice-T, and the show is Ice Loves Coco. And this song Thursday, where she sends pictures of herself, and and I, I saw them um, 
I saw those pictures. They are, you know, practically naked. Is that considered sexting or is this different? Because it's consensual. If you want to receive, you know you're going to receive her pictures on Thursdays in the thong, and you can stay on her Twitter account or not. Is that something that we're talking about? Or is that is that what sets kids up to do it? Or is that what set Anthony Weiner up to do it? Any, any idea about that? Well, I think the bottom line is that by her doing that, it's not much different than logging on and, and paying a monthly fee to be on a porn star site that you'll receive your monthly newsletter or your weekly half-naked picture. That's probably just a different medium to do that in. However, allowing people to see that you can send that kind of a, a photo across a social network or through texting has then, I think, led other people to think, well, gee, I can do it too. And it's kind of it's led people into that whole world of allowing themselves to do it. Now, what then allows people to do it and what judgment process their brains go through to actually push that button is really the issue. And so people like Wiener and those kinds of incidences, you have to take a look at what is the motivating behavior behind putting that picture on your phone and then pushing that actual button or putting it on your Twitter account and not really having the judgment and the impulse control and the thoughtful process of who's going to see this, is this the right thing to do in light of who I am, those kinds of things. So that takes you into that whole other realm of why other people are doing it. Yeah, really, because, you know, it, the, the, it, the sex thing that Coco did got her a TV show. But when right. Wiener did it and the other one, they their career is gone. I mean, uh Right. I mean, one was being done much more in a business umbrella light. The other was done as an impulsive acting out behavior. And unfortunately, oftentimes when we see people acting out in the ways that Wiener did or people who are having infidelities that are married are really acting out behaviors because they're angry. And what are they doing to soothe themselves is this self-destructive behavior instead of dealing with truly how they feel and what needs to be dealt with in their life. So if someone's angry and they find a little side street to slip into and, and have an emotional easy street, they take it instead of really doing the hard work of figuring out what's going on in my life, why do I need to really, you know, why am I not happy and how can I better deal with this than these other behaviors that are only going to implode well, for me. I'll tell you, Anthony Weiner was newly married. His wife is pregnant. I mean, uh, he's unhappy already. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that he's not Crazy. dealing with the things that are coming up because if this clearly was a behavior of his, not necessarily the sex thing, but being around about and being out there with women and needing to flirt and needing whatever he got back from that kind of interaction with other people, and then that suddenly can't be something he does once you're married out of the respect of the marriage, that'll make somebody angry. And if you're not aware of that and dealing with that, it builds up over time. So there are things that are triggering someone to act out and not use good ways when they act out and good judgment. All right. Anthony Weiner, his, his website is drsophysophy.com. Please give him a call because he Thanks. needs your help, doctor. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Now, I saw a poll, 17% of adults aged 30 to 49 have sexed, but it's not really, they're not the ones that are primarily doing it. And the consequences are, are, are quite different when it's an adult or a celebrity doing it. Who, who are primarily the sexters out there? Well, I think primarily sexters are younger kids that are doing things because, again, we're looking at impulsivity, impulse control, judgment, insight, and those are functions of your brain that usually are not fully formed until you're about 25. So you're seeing people who are either in their brains, not fully developed, like children, adolescents, teenagers, right. young adults, exactly. or older adults who have not emotionally or physically matured to the way that, to the level that they should, and acting out of impulse with poor judgment and trying to meet needs that are being met really in a not great way. So I think the bottom line is that you got to look at these and really understand what's driving behaviors, whether it's whatever age it is, and really start to address it in a better way. People are, well, that's are, why we would expect teenagers to do it, because they yeah. don't have the, the, you know, that fully formed sense. And 
the consequences are, you know, Wiener lost his political career. Maybe. Probably. We hope. I hope. I do. But yes. there are some really drastic consequences for, for teens. And, um, you know what, let, let's, let's see if we can take a break now and give us, give us more time. Let's come back, because I want to talk about the consequences for the kids that are doing it, what, what they stand to lose, and then let's give a couple of tips. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. one 472 5787 That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. You're walking alone. A group of people is hanging out just ahead. Suddenly, they surround you. Hey, yo, where you going? Come here. Before you know it, you're being robbed. It's called a pack robbery, a robbery involving a group of assailants, and it can be violent. In times like these, trust your instincts. Don't become their next victim. Avoid suspicious groups. Avoid desolate or poorly lighted areas. Be aware of your surroundings. To learn more about pack robberies, visit ncpc.org or contact your local law enforcement agency. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, National Crime Prevention Council, and the Ad Council. Protect yourself and your family with MyForce, a personal security service accessed through a smartphone app that acts as your dedicated safety escort. The one-touch alert connects to a live monitoring team that provides the authorities with crucial details to expedite help. MyForce provides emergency response with the user's exact location, physical description, known safety issues, and medical conditions. MyForce offers monthly subscriptions at $11.99 per month or save with the annual plan of $119 a year. As a listener of Crime Prevention 101, one, receive $20 off an annual subscription by using promo code CP101. Visit MyForce.com today. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello again, and I do not want you to forget that Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes. You can take us with you wherever you go. Um, I just want to also let you know I've got a couple of good sexting resources for you. I'm going to post the links to them on my on the show notes in my blog, CrimePrevention101.com. I'll put them on my Facebook also. Maybe you'll take a look at my Facebook. I'm also posting the links to Dr. Sophie's book, uh, Side by Side, and his website again, DrSophie.com, S-O-P-H-Y. All right, just, just quickly, Dr. Sophie. What are some of the consequences for teens if if they are text are sexting there? There are there are many consequences, but the, for teens that are sexting, the biggest and most important ones are many times a teen who is sending a text does not realize that they are maybe committing a crime because you are violating lines with other people who are receiving it. You do not always know who's receiving it on the other end. And if it is a minor receiving it on the other end, it is considered a crime in some jurisdictions. So be aware of that fact. And moms and dads, please look at your children's phones. Look at their phone bills. See what they're texting. See who they're texting. Turn phones off at a certain time. Those, the phones are there to really help your child and to be able to allow them to stay connected but that does not mean you can't pick them up and open them and have parameters on them. So there are a lot of bad outcomes that can come out of these things. Kids could be feeling the impact of that text, not knowing how it's taken. They can hurt themselves because they think they're not liked. They think they're being made fun of. They're humiliated. There are many different uncontrollable outcomes from sex. Dr. Sophie, isn't there a case in Florida, at least the only one I know of anyway, where, uh, an 18-year-old is now uh, listed as a sex offender because he he uh, sent nude pictures of his 16-year-old girlfriend after to his uh, he posted them after an argument with her. He's now a sex offender. I mean, this can exactly. damage so, you for life. Exactly, there are impact and damages that that can have 
long-term effects for you for the way that you go forward in the future, any criminal record that you may have. So really, parents, oversee your children as they have these technologies in their hands. These are young brains. They are excited about certain things. They are impulsive. So please make sure you're overseeing and you're doing your job as a parent and watching over them. It can it can absolutely destroy a a, a child's life because what what's absolutely. out there on that internet never goes away, right? And never. Then also look at you know if you're a, if you're a young adult or you're in your twenties and you're sending these kinds of things, be aware of yourself, be aware of the need of why you're doing it, and are there any risks? Always ask yourself before you push that button: Are there any risks to this before I send it that will impact me or others in a negative way? And you're never really going to come up with a clear, no, there are not, and therefore I wouldn't send it then. Uh, Doctor, do you recommend that uh, kids turn their cell phones in and devices and laptops before bedtime because uh, they could they could wake up in the middle of the night and start texting absolutely, or something like that? Absolutely. All, during mealtime, everything should be turned off and put away. And at bedtime, there should be a certain time that all phones are turned off hand it in to parents, and that's the time that parents can go through them if they need to to see what the daily content was. They also can check phone bills at the end of the month. But, yes, I think they need to be turned off, and I think that the technology needs to charge up and your child needs to have a brain rest and to be able to calm down and learn how to soothe themselves with natural self-soothing techniques instead of constantly having to be stimulated by these kinds of toys. Absolutely, and I've also heard that it is um, a, a good idea that the kids not have a computer of any kind in the bedroom, that it must be in a common area where it can be easily monitored. Ah, uh, right, exactly. I mean, I think that any child needs to learn the basics of living. Pretend your child is going to live on an island. What are the basic self-soothing tools and the basics that they are going to need to survive. Pretend they don't have a phone all the time and they don't have access to these kinds of things. Teach your child how to be happy with themselves, how to make themselves happy, how to soothe themselves, that they have hobbies, that they learn to read and enjoy it, and that they have the craft and the kinds of things that are going to build them as people. That's what lasts them a lifetime. And what should a parent say to their kid when the, when the kid says, you don't trust me? If you trusted me, you wouldn't have to see everything that I'm doing. What do you say to the kids when they, when they do that? First of all, I tell parents that this conversation should start very early, six years old, seven years old, eight years old. Start that dialogue early so your child knows that they've heard it before and it's not based in mistrust. It's based in that's the way that I parent. If you aren't going to start it early and now you're starting at 12 or, or later, then you do have to start understanding, that, start that dialogue, understanding that your child is now somewhat structured and going to want to be more independent. So it is a back and forth discussion that you have that you need to know what goes on, but you will allow them some privacy and give them an inch and you take an inch. And if they handle their inch, great, then they get another inch. And it's all built on trust that way instead of, pulling it away and making them earn it all back because you're starting a little late. That's a very good idea, actually. I never thought about that. But you know what? These, these kids are sexting at 11 and maybe even younger. I don't even know. There's nothing to sext when you're 10. But parenting maybe... styles need to be integrated early on in, in your child's life. They're not coming on as crisis management tools. They should really be part of the regular toolbox you use in parenting so that your kid just learns to expect that my mom or my dad are going to just check my computer, my URL addresses, my texting, my phone bill, the content of my emails. You know, it's just an expectation because that's who my parents are. And at the end of the day, parents may not believe this, but your kid loves the safety and, and the security that comes with knowing that someone is trying to keep them safe. Because at Absolutely. the end of the day, they're kids. Absolutely. And one other thing I have to say Parents, you've got to learn the, comp the texting shorthand. And people email me all the time with these crazy initials. And you know what? I go to Google and I go, what does IMO mean? And that's how I find out what they're saying. Right. right. And, and on, on, I work with LG phones, and lgtexted.com is a great website to go to that gives you a glossary of a lot of that stuff 
gives you parameters. We have a ton of videos and ways for you to begin dialogues with your children about sexting, about texting, about bullying on the Can internet. Can you give me that phone. again? LG? TextEd.com. TextEd.com. Great. All right, because that's so important, parents. Well, yep. Dr. Sophie, thank you so much for being with me. It's Dr. Sophie, S O P H Y dot com. And right. I'm going to post uh, these tips in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Take care. Bye. All right. Now we're going to go right in and talk with my buddy Todd Morris, founder and CEO of Brickhouse Security. And he is an expert in the field of technological surveillance and security. Hey, Todd. Hello there. How are you doing? Nice to hear from you. Yes, it is a pleasure having you back on Crime Prevention 101. And I don't know if you got a, if you uh, got a chance to listen in on a little bit, but we were talking about sexting, and one of the things that that we also want parents to do is they've got to get savvy about some of the the, the technology that's out there that's going to help them keep track of what the kids are doing. So why don't we just jump right in? Um, what do you recommend? Brickhouse Security has got a ton of products there. What have you got for us? Well, one of the main concerns parents have is that they are technologically outgunned by their teenagers. C3, their teenagers absolutely. are simply more technologically savvy than they are, and they know the tools. So for parents, it's difficult to know what your teens are doing. What we try to do is offer parents tools to help them uncover what their teens might be trying to hide from them. Okay. And what, what, would you, what, what, is, what are some of the things you got? So, in particular, different phones store their text message in different ways. So, for each of the most popular phones, the iPhone, the Android, simple text messaging phones, we've come up with software that will allow a parent to uncover deleted text messages. These are the messages that a teen might send out and then quickly delete so they don't show up in the out basket. Very tricky. I like it. So you can, you can plug it into the... How does it work again? So depending on the phone, if it's a smartphone, you would plug a cable into it and then connect it to your computer. This would allow you to basically download all the data deleted text messages, sent text messages, address books, browsing history in the browser, maps history showing what addresses they've looked up and where they've went, and really give you a very keen insight into where your teenager is going, who they're communicating with, and what they're saying. And will, this, will it work also um, what they send out on their computer? So there is a parallel technology called the Stealth iBot, which will allow you to do something very similar on a computer to find out who they're emailing with, who they're, text, who they're instant messaging with, and who they're communicating with on Facebook. One of the things a lot of parents don't realize is that kids will often set up multiple email addresses and even multiple Facebook accounts. So they'll have one Facebook account that you know about and that you might even friend them on and be able to monitor, and then they have another Facebook account that you have no idea about and you don't know who they're communicating with, and it's there specifically so that they can have covert communications with their friends. Oh, that is tricky. Children that, uh... are very technologically savvy, and it comes very naturally to them, and it's just very easy for them to find these private ways to have a conversation that parents and teachers know nothing about. So will this technology uncover this, all their, all their aliases? Or? It'll basically show you every website they go to along with the username and password. So you'll quickly find out that the Yahoo email address you know about might not be the only email address they have. You'll see they're going to Hotmail or they're going to Yahoo and plugging in a different username and password than you're aware of. That'll allow you to then log into that same account and find out who they're talking to. Wow. I mean, you know, and I, just, I raised this question before with Dr. Sophie. Also, you know, it's like parents don't want to, 
they don't want to check up on the, on the kid like that. I mean, that's very invasive. And would, would you, you know, would you say that you do it automatically as a matter of course? He said you get them used to it starting from when the kid is young and they're going to know that you're, 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 you're checking up or, or do you like wait until you have a suspicion? I know you do a lot of lecturing on this. What do you, what do you think? Like wait until, well, wait until you might have cause say, or? Not all parents should be deeply investigating what all their teenagers do. However, all parents should have some idea of who their kids are talking to. And when you and I were growing up, that was pretty simple. Our parents knew who we were talking to because there were only two phones in the house, one in their bedroom and one in the living room or the kitchen. And everyone in the house could hear who you were talking to and what you were saying. Kids just didn't have the same level of privacy when we were growing up that kids today have. And quite honestly, they don't have the privacy because they deserve it or because they are more trustworthy than we were. They have it because they're more technologically savvy. Well, that's, that's true. I, you know, I just, it's just like this loss of, loss of something, you know, but it's, it's just something to consider and you, and you got to be able to consider it. Um, you know, you got to weigh the options and I guess you have to know, know your kids, but don't forget that kids that get A's and that are good kids can, are still, can, you know, could still be concealing things you'd rather they didn't. So it's something, it's something Absolutely. to keep in mind, I guess. Yeah, there, there are signs that any child psychologist or any high school counselor will tell you about that are the signs of depression, drug use, cyber bullying, or other yeah, types of don't. issues. And they don't always, but it doesn't always show those, either. You know, it's, it's not always if depressed. If you see those, your child's in high things. risk, just because yeah. you don't see those doesn't mean your child doesn't deserve some level of adult supervision. That, that's true. That's a good point. I just, you know, I balk at it, and I know a lot of parents do, but it makes it, you make, it makes a good point. Now, if I went to uh, your website, BrickHouseSecurity.com, and I wanted to find these things, what would I do? How would I? Uh... Well, it's one of the top categories on our menu, which is cell phone surveillance. And cell if you click on cell phone surveillance, you'll see it. We also have a category just for teenage situation for parents ah. or teenagers that they're worried about. All right. Very quickly now, also, you know, and we've got about three minutes. It's August, the prime month for burglaries and home invasions, mostly because people are away on vacation. What do you recommend for this kind of situation? We want to discourage those pesky burglars. So there are some basic things you can do that will make you less of a hard target for burglary. And, you know, really basic things like get to know your neighbors, be a good neighbor, and tell your neighbors when you're going on vacation, and let them know when they're on vacation, you're willing to take out their garbage for them, bring in the mail for them. You know, the more your house looks lived in and the less there are signs that you're not there, the less of a target you are. If everyone else on the block has their garbage can out for the garbage man and you don't, then a lot of people on the street know you're not there. All right, but if I wanted to put, you know, I know I can get a burglar alarm. What else do you recommend that I put on put on the house? You know, those are all good things. We know we should do those things. But what if I need, and what, if, what about home invasion? How can I set up a panic room or something like that? So one of the things that we recommend people do is have a plan for these types of things. A little bit of thinking beforehand will mean that when something does happen, you're prepared for it. So it might be that you know the escape route from your house to get out because you really shouldn't be starting an altercation with someone who breaks into your house. You should be getting out of your house. And you quite honestly, every cell phone now, if you basically hold down the 9 key, it will almost always automatically dial 911 for you. I'm not sure why this isn't better advertised, but... Hmm. I didn't even know that. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, well. All right. Um, it's BrickHouseSecurity.com. Todd, sorry. We, I want you, you want you to come back. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Um, 
technology isn't in our favor sometimes, but there are a lot of things you can do. And if you can't get out of the house and you want to set up a panic room, even if it's just a closet, get um, there's some, all sorts of locks you can get on the door. You want to have a little phone in there, bring your cell phone in there so you can call 911. And, um, and, a, and uh, I'm going to put some information on setting up a panic room against home invasions. And it, you can find it there on CrimePrevention101.com. So, you know what? That's a wrap for tonight. Uh, please don't forget, we always love to hear from you. I want you to post your comments and suggestions. Uh, you can email me, solutions at fightsafe.com. You could email me through the, my, my blog, crimeprevention101.com. Let me know if you read any of the books that we've talked about tonight or on some of the other sh- summer shows that I've done. Let me know if you liked any of the personal safety products that I tell you about on this show. Don't forget to tell your friends about us so they can become part of the movement. And you and I will be doing this again next week. Same time, same Internet. It would be a crime not to listen, so stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guests, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimeprevention101.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.